Great. I think it's time to yield the floor to Eric for the director's report. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jen. So I want to welcome again all of you to this open session of the advisory council meeting, um, including a very packed room here, but I also know many of you watching virtually and many more who will watch uh, video recordings of this. And um, as with the rest of the open session, we do video record this and we make that recording available as part of a permanent archive of, on our institute's website, genome.gov. Um, as a reminder, and for those who are new to our council meetings, we create this uh, electronic resource for my director's report, very much analogous to a supplemental materials section of a published paper. Um, the URL is shown here. The slides I'm going to show uh, during my director's report are available either as native PowerPoint files or as also in PDF format. And then meanwhile, when there's relevant documents or websites or other things that you want to access for a particular slide, you'll find a document number in the bottom right-hand corner, which references um, exactly uh, what we're trying to point you towards. And you can just go to this web page and click on it and uh, see the exact document number. And so all of these materials, this web page, everything is going to be permanently archived on genome.gov as a historic um, uh, um, materials for this meeting. So the open session is going to have a number of additional uh, presentations that I'm not going to go in very much depth on any of the topics that are going to be uh, covered by others. Um, following my director's report, uh, Vince Bonham, NHGRI's acting deputy director, is going to give a presentation on looking back and looking forward, NHGRI's training diversity and health equity program, um, during which he will also introduce the new director of NHGRI's training diversity and health equity office, Rob Rivers. Um, then after lunch, Sean Mooney, director of NIH's Center for Information Technology, will give a presentation on a new vision and role for the NIH Center for Information Technology, or CIT. And then our other external guest is going to be Lyric Jorgensen, who's the NIH Associate Director for Science Policy, and she's going to be discussing administration priorities and NIH policy update. And then we're going to get to work on concept clearances. And there's going to be four concept clearances presented by extramural program directors. First, Stephanie Morris will present a concept clearance on the impact of genomic variation on function, or IGVF, renewal. Next, you're going to hear from Lisa Chadwick, who's going to present a concept clearance on the genomics research to elucidate the genetics of rare diseases, or Gregor, renewal. And then Rob Raleigh will take over, and he's going to present a concept clearance on the electronic medical records and genomics, or eMERGE renewal. And finally, Christine Chang will present a concept clearance on the Advancing Genomic Medicine Research, or ACMR, renewal. So that's what's in store for us during uh, the open session. What I'm going to do is work my way through these seven bins of topics, um, which have served us well for now many years. We're going to start with NHGRI updates. And uh, here's going to be the official slide on the individual who we honored to start uh, the open session. So for more than 30 years of service in the U.S. government and 28 years of what is now NHGRI, Rudy Pizzotti will be retiring at the end of 2024. Um, Rudy has been a driver of the NHGRI scientific review branch since joining the Institute in 1996. And in his leadership of the branch as either the chief or co-chief, he has overseen peer review of all grant applications assigned to NHGRI. And for over a quarter of a century, Rudy has been an exemplar of scientific acumen and professionalism with his careful consideration of each application, his ability to find and recruit the expertise needed uh, to provide the best and most constructive review of each application, his diplomatic cooperation with all of his colleagues, and his dedication to the integrity of the peer review process. As uh, I think all of you appreciate, he's just one of the nicest human beings you'll ever, uh, you'll ever meet. And I mentioned at the beginning of this council meeting that Rudy took on the role of exec secretary of this council, where I think he has flawlessly orchestrated careful consideration of concepts, funding plans, and special concept consideration, special council considerations. His diligent work and kind temperament has served past and present council members well. He just seems to have the ability to ask the right questions at the right time and solicit the needed feedback and constructive criticism. He's, by the way, not perfect. And you can see from the picture on the bottom right, occasionally he isn't perfect because early at, at a couple of times in presiding over council, he would have a coffee mug with a corporate logo on it, which he obviously got free or signed. So here's one for Marriott. And then 
our ethics people would chase him and say, you have to stop looking like you're subtly endorsing products. I always told him you should put a little sticky, you know, your name here for rent and then give, a, give an email address. So, so he's not perfect and he later learned not to use mugs that have corporate logos on them. But besides that, Rudy, we're gonna miss you. Uh, NIH is gonna miss you, NHR is gonna miss you, the council is gonna miss you, I'm gonna miss you, but please uh, keep in touch. Another departure um, from NHGRI is Carolyn Hutter, who's currently the director of NHGRI's Division of Genome Sciences, who's gonna be leaving the institute next month to become the director of the NIH Office of Strategic Coordination, which importantly, plans, manages, and oversees activities funded by the NIH Common Fund. Carolyn has been the director of the Division of Genome Sciences since 2018. In this role, she has led efforts to support and accelerate foundational resources, technology development, and experimental approaches, and analytical tools in genome sciences. She actually joined the NIH back in 2012, first serving as a program director in the National Cancer Institute's Epidemiology and Genomics Research Program. She then came to NHGRI in 2013, first as a program director in the Division of Genomic Medicine, but more recently became the division director in, um, in the Division of Genome Sciences. And as a key leader of our extramural research program for the past seven plus years, Carolyn has been a pivotal, played a pivotal role in shaping the Institute's extramural portfolio, and she's been an extremely valuable member of my leadership team. She's going to take her new position on October 6th. And, um, since NHGRI is always involved in lots of common fund programs, we will continue working with her in this new role. Um, by way of, uh, of looking forward, uh, Larry Brody will serve as the acting division director while a search for Carolyn's replacement is conducted. That search is going as quickly as we can humanly make it possible to go. Um, and, uh, and in fact, note that the application deadline for this position is Wednesday, September 11th. So in two days, applications are due, and we are hoping to move that search along as quick as we can. And nobody wants to see that happen more than Larry Brody. So, uh, so he doesn't have two divisions to have to, to oversee. Another departure, um, in July, Lucia Hindorf became, began a new position as the senior advisor for the White House Research Initiatives and chief of staff within the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health. Throughout her years at NHGRI, Lucia served as a program director in the Division of Genomic Medicine and was most recently working as the extramural training team lead within NHGRI's Training Diversity and Health Equity Office. In her new role, she will be making important connections across the NIH and the Department of Health and Human Services in an effort that will aim to improve women's health. And we certainly wish Lucia the best in her new role. Those are the departures, but now let's talk about arrivals. In July, Rob Rivers joined NHGRI as director of the Training, Diversity, and Health Equity Office. In this role, Rob will oversee initiatives that expand opportunities for genomics education and careers, cultivate genomics training programs and workforce development initiatives for individuals underrepresented in biomedical research, and promote and fund genomics research to improve minority health, reduce health, reduce health disparities, and foster health equity. Rob started his NIH career as an American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS, Science and Technology Policy Fellow. Prior to joining NHGRI, Rob was serving as the acting director of the Office of Minority Health Research Coordination at the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. He assisted program staff and officials in advancing programs and initiatives that address disease and disorders that are disproportionately impacting the health of racial and ethnic minority populations and that promote programs that foster the recruitment and training of individuals from diverse backgrounds. Rob received a BS in chemistry from Kentucky State University and a PhD in chemistry from the University of Cambridge. And you're going to hear from Rob later today in this open session of the council meeting. In August, Edam Gabnak joined NHGRI as a program director in the Division of Genome Sciences, where he'll be working on the Human Genome Reference Program and the Computational Genomics and Data Science Program. Prior to joining NHGRI, he was the director of the Data Science for the Impact of Genomic Variation on Function, or IGVF, Data Administrative Coordination Center at Stanford University. After receiving his PhD at Ben Gurion University and completing a postdoctoral research fellowship at Stanford University, he joined the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, or ENCODE, Data Coordination Center at Stanford University, where he worked as a Data Wranglers team lead 
and a computation pipelines team lead before taking on his role in the IGVF program. So welcome. Also, Molly Manier is joining NHGRI literally today as a program director in the Division of Genomic Medicine and will be working remotely from Rochester, Minnesota on a portfolio of grants related to genetic epidemiology. Molly was a program director at the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, or NICHD, where she oversaw research on newborn screening and rare genetic conditions, as well as on the ClinGen and Developmental Genotype Tissue Expression Projects. Prior to joining NICHD, she was a program director and, a, again, a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute where she worked on guidance related to the return of genetic research results to participate participants in longitudinal epidemiologic cohort, cohort studies. Molly received a BS in cell and molecular biology and genetics from the University of Maryland, a PhD in genetics and genomics from Duke University, and postdoctoral training also at Duke University in the ethical, legal, and social implications of genomics within an, the NHGRI-funded Center of Excellence in LC Research at that institution. In June, Sharnay Tingle joined NHGRI as a genomic program administrator in the Division of Extramural Operations. Her role includes assisting extramural and intramural investigators in depositing genomic data into public repositories such as dbGaP and Anvil. Prior to joining NHGRI, Sharnay was a health specialist in the National Institute on Aging's Division of Neuroscience in the Population and Genetics Branch supporting the genetics portfolio and data management and sharing policy implementation. She has also worked as a program coordinator in the National Cancer Institute's Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis and as a program analyst and cancer research training award fellow in NCI's Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences to support implementation of the NIH genomic data sharing policy. In July, Christopher Williams joined NHGRI as the lead education outreach specialist in the education and community involvement branch. Before joining NHGRI, he worked as the STEM education program manager for the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of African American History and Culture, where he engaged teachers and students from third grade through 12th grade in addition to the general public by sharing the stories of African Americans and their accomplishments in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and invention. Um, prior to his time at the Smithsonian, he was, and you guessed it, a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow. There is a pattern. It is a great fellowship program. It's a pipeline. Um, this case at the National Science Foundation, which occurred following a postdoctoral research fellowship at the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. Some of you may recall that NIH partners with the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, or ACMG, to lead the NIH ACMG Genomic Medicine Program Management Fellowship Program, which prepares health practitioners to manage research and implementation programs in genomic medicine. The two new NIH ACMG fellows for the, tw the years 2024 to 2026 are Rachel Nussbaum and Nicole Thompson. Rachel is a genetic counselor and was previously the assistant program director of the Masters in Genetic Counseling Training Program at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. She has experience in clinical cancer genetics, social and behavioral genetic counseling research, and educational initiatives to increase diversity in the genetic counseling profession. Rachel received a BS in Integrated Science and Technology from James Madison University and a master's degree in genetic counseling from the University of Pittsburgh. Nicole is also a genetic counselor, specializing in clinical and research cancer genetics. She previously served as director of the Hereditary Cancer Genetic Counseling Program at Howard University Hospital, where she founded and established the first cancer genetic counseling clinic. Nicole has experience in program development, community education, teaching, and advocacy. And she attended Florida State University and received her master's degree in genetic counseling from Howard University. And just big picture, the NIH ACMG Genomic Medicine Program Management Fellowship is now accepting applications for its next year's class. The program is a full-time two-year and paid experience. The fellowship seeks experienced clinicians who want to acquire credentials and experience to lead genomic medicine research and implementation programs. 
It is open to qualified health practitioners, such as physicians, physician assistants and associates, advanced practice nurses, and as you heard from our newest uh, members, genetic counselors. Fellows rotate through genomic medicine uh, programs at the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics and uh, multiple NIH sites, such as NHGRI, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, and the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, and also the All of Us Research Program. Uh, fellows have gone on to obtain positions at institutions such as the NIH, the World Health Organization, and major medical institutions. And again, the next set of applications are due on December 6th, uh, later this year. I want to make you aware that there is a new colloquium that you could all watch if you're interested. It's a virtual colloquium. It's called the Journeys in Human Genetics and Genomics Colloquium. It's a virtual lecture series sponsored by the American Society of Human Genetics, ASHG, and NHGRI. We designed this lecture series in conjunction with the launching of our recently expanded ASHG, NHGRI Genomics and Public Service Fellowship Program, which consists of four different fellowship opportunities. And we've now organized this base curriculum reflected by the roughly 50 virtual lectures that will take place over a two-year interval. The goal of the colloquium is to showcase the depth and breadth of the scientific, clinical, and societal elements of human genetics and genomics, as well as to illustrate the myriad associated career opportunities. The colloquium is going to feature about 25 lectures a year given by distinguished members of the genetics and genomics community. Don't be misled that the first two happen to be two NHGRI people. The great majority are non-NHGRI people. Five lectures have been given to date, and importantly, the recorded lectures and the associated materials, including PowerPoint files and recommended supplementary readings, are all going to be made available, or in fact, they're already being made available um, on genome.gov. So this will be a great lecture series to point other people to, to learn basics in genetics and genomics. Uh, last month, uh, during the first week of July, I traveled to Australia for a whirlwind genomics intensive visit uh, to uh, the country. Uh, my genomics tour down under consisted of five days, three cities, three seminars, and dozens of meetings, including wonderful discussions with trainees and early stage investigators. It was fast-paced and dense, but rewarding. I learned a tremendous amount about the impressive and recent progress in genomics, and in particular in genomic medicine across Australia, significant growth since when I was there 12 years ago. Um, and that included some very important new work going on with their indigenous communities. Uh, my personal thanks to Daniel MacArthur and Tiffany Botwood for arranging a wonderfully productive visit for me in Australia. And with that, I'll move on to some general NIH updates, including some breaking news from last week, late last week, actually. And I announced, NIH announced the selection of Jerry Donenberg as the new director of the NIH Office of AIDS Research and the NIH Associate Director for AIDS Research. Jerry has over 25 years of experience in the HIV AIDS research arena, focusing on implementation science and aiming to optimize intervention delivery and clinical outcomes. She has led numerous NIH-funded studies and was one of the first to link mental health to adolescent HIV risk-taking, designing prevention interventions for youth with mental health challenges. And she comes to NIH from the University of Illinois, Chicago. The NIH is um, issuing a follow-up request for information, or an RFI, to inform the advisory committee to the NIH director on implementing recommendations for re-envisioning NIH-supported postdoctoral training. Recommendations have been selected and presented in the RFI and are available for comment. The recommendations for changes to U.S. postdoctoral research training are as follows. First, to limit the total number of years a person can be supported by NIH funds in a postdoctoral position to no more than five years. Revise the K99R00 mechanism to focus on ideas and creativity over productivity. And promote training and professional development of both postdoctoral scholars and their mentors. These proposed actions are in addition to the National Research Service Award pay level increases that were made earlier this year. And to ensure all feedback is considered, responses are, are to be submitted by October.
feel like, oh, there, I'm back, okay. The NIH director recently released a statement supporting our valued Asian American, Asian immigrant, and Asian research colleagues. Um, in recent years, the NIH has implemented measures to protect the integrity of NIH-funded research, which have led to reductions in violations, such as breaches of peer review confidentiality and failures in reporting foreign affiliations, particularly from the People's Republic of China. While these actions are necessary to protect, protect research integrity, they have unintentionally created a challenging environment for Asian American, Asian immigrant, and Asian researchers who feel unfairly targeted. NIH values its relationship with Asian researchers and is committed to promoting a diverse and inclusive research community. NIH's efforts to address foreign interference are applied in a non-discriminatory manner consistent with federal guidelines. To repair um, and strengthen uh, relationships with Asian uh, researchers, NIH is working with various stakeholders to implement research security, training, create guidelines, and develop tools that protect research integrity, all while fostering international collaborations that are essential for advancing NIH's mission. And the goal is to restore relationships and ensure a welcoming environment while at the same time safeguarding research integrity. Moving on to budget realities, U.S. federal or U.S. governmental funding will run out on September 30th unless a budget or a continuing resolution, called the CR, is passed. As of now, the budget is uncertain as the House and the Senate bills have different top line numbers. Let me help you walk through this um, a, a table. As shown in the third column, the House proposed a $48.581 billion budget for NIH's fiscal year 2025. Um, a 0.8% increase from fiscal year 2024 enacted budget. Um, meanwhile, the House also proposed restructuring the NIH, reducing the number of institutes from 27 to 15. And in this proposal, the NHGRI would be merged with the National Library of Medicine and the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. However, the bill's authors stated that NIH restructuring will not pass this fiscal year, but instead serves as a conversation starter. As shown on the fifth column, the Senate proposed a $50.224 billion budget for NIH's fiscal year 2025, a 4% increase from the fiscal year 2024 enacted budget. Under this scenario, NHGRI would receive $663 million under the Senate proposal, um, the same as fiscal year 2024. So even though the NIH would get an increase, NHGRI wouldn't necessarily get that. Well. Given that the House and the Senate have written their NIH funding bills completely differently, coupled with other significant differences between the two budget proposals, not to mention that this is an election year, uh, we expect that some sort of a continuing resolution seems to be a likely part of our future. And with that, I will move on to some general genomics updates. Some of you may be aware that Maxine Singer, a very well-known biochemist, molecular biologist, and visionary leader, passed away in July. She joined the laboratory of Leon Heppel at NIH. And then in 1980, she was appointed chief of the laboratory of biochemistry at the National Cancer Institute, and later served as the president of Carnegie Institute of Washington from 1988 until 2002. Among her many accolades and awards, Maxine was an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences, and the American Philosophical Society, and also an awardee of the National Medal of Science. Um, she was also the first woman to win a Vanderveer Bush Award. She was instrumental in developing guidelines that protected the then nascent field of biotechnology when we were seeing the new tools of recombinant DNA come on the scene. She helped to calm the fears that this new science would give way to the spread of deadly lab-produced microbes. On a happier note, in June, the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, or FNIH, named Howard Chang of Stanford University as the recipient of this year's Lurie Prize in Biomedical Sciences. This award recognizes outstanding achievements by promising scientists who are 52 years of age or younger. Howard and his research group have helped to reveal the vital importance of long non-coding RNAs in gene regulation and its impact on human diseases, such as cancer and autoimmunity. He is an NHGRI awardee. He's an awardee in NHGRI Centers of Excellence in Genomics Science program, and he is a former member of this advisory council. 
And it turns out he's a current member of the advisory committee to the NIH director. So congratulations to Howard. Uh, in some brand new photos from late last week, the 2024 a uh, AGBT Precision Health meeting was held late last week in Denver. I serve as the co-chair of the organizing committee for this meeting along with Michael Talkowski and former council member Wendy Chung. That group is shown in the photo in the upper left. The opening speaker for the meeting was council member Nancy Cox, who's shown in the photo on the lower left. And other attendees at last week's meeting include current council member Gal Jarvik and former council member Len Panakia. Now, contributing greatly to my ongoing midlife crisis was Len Panakia's son, Alex. A photo of me and Alex is shown on the bottom right. He not only attended the meeting, but he presented a poster on his ongoing genomics research at UCSF. And I, I remember him when he was like this tall, and now he's presenting posters and it's killing, I don't know, it's killing me. I think Nancy and Gail share my pain, but delight. It was, it was delight, what a great poster, what a, it was in any case. It was, it was a great meeting, besides that. All right, moving on to NHGRI extramural research program, and we will start with the Centers of Excellence in Genomic Science, or SEGS program, which supports interdisciplinary research teams working together to develop highly innovative approaches in genomics research. For example, the Center for Multiplex Assessment of Phenotype, which is led by Doug Fowler at the University of Washington, was renewed this summer. Uh, this SEGS will develop technologies for mapping variant effects for coding genes at scale across a wide range of environmental conditions, genetic contexts, and multicellular systems. The SEGS will also develop tools that leverage multiplex functional data to improve the prediction of disease risk. I will note that the next receipt date for the current SEGS funding opportunity is June 23rd of next year. In August of 2022, NHGRI launched the Molecular Phenotypes of Null Alleles in Cells, or MORPHIC Consortium, which aims to develop an extensive catalog of molecular and cellular phenotypes for null alleles of every human gene. The program is still early in its first phase, laying the foundation for the program and generating some of its earliest data. In July, MORPHIC held a virtual consortium meeting featuring 70 attendees, including all the MORPHIC centers and the external scientific consultants. The two-day meeting highlighted experimental design, data pipeline plans for the first public data release, individual scientific results, and also progress updates. And there was a pretty good, nice, uh, strong uh, trainee presence throughout the planning process and the meeting itself with trainee organizers, presenters, and moderators. In 2023, NHGRI partnered with the National Science Foundation, or NSF, to solicit applications through something called the Molecular Foundations in Biotechnologies, or MFB, program. As part of this collaboration, NHGRI and NSF awarded $15.4 million for RNA research, of which $2.7 million went to two NIH-funded research groups. Now, as part of this MFB collaboration, NSF, and NHGRI worked with the University Industry Demonstration Partnership to hold a workshop last May on advancing high-risk, high-reward research and translating knowledge into biotechnology solutions. Workshop participants included academic, corporate, and government representatives. Uh, the presentations and the discussions are all of, um, are, are focused on identifying research directions with greater translational opportunities and commercial relevance. NHGRI's Genome Technology Program continues to promote innovative technology development, paving the way towards expanded use of genomics in both basic and clinical research. In July, NHGRI released a revised Notice of Special Interest, called a NOSI, encouraging applications focused on advancing genomic technology development for research and clinical applications. And the next due date for this NOSI is January 5th of next year. Meanwhile, the annual Genome Technology Program meeting, known as the Advances in Genomic Technology Development Grantee Meeting, was held this past June. The meeting provided an open forum for the discussion of recent research developments, current challenges in the field, and methods to continue pushing genomics forward. Meeting topics cover the full breadth of NHGRI's Genome Technology Program, including nucleic acid sequencing and synthesis, protein DNA interactions, and genome-wide methods for advancing functional genomics. 
The 2024 Advances in Genomic Technology Development meeting also brought back an Open Science Day. Now, this is held on the first day of the meeting, um, and this Open Science Day invites local students, researchers, and others who are interested in learning more about the Institute's Genome Technology Program and NHGRI-supported science. During the Open Science Day, there were two small business hands-on workshops from current NHGRI grantees or awardees that are listed here. And then in the afternoon, participants heard presentations about emerging technologies, presentations from field experts, and then a keynote uh, talk by Stacy Gabriel of the Broad Institute. And recordings from the Open Science Day can be found on the Technology Development Coordinating Center's YouTube channel. NHGRI's small business program continues to support innovative research in genomic technology development, genomic medicine, computational genomics, and other NHGRI-supported scientific areas. The Institute encourages researchers who are interested in commercializing their science to visit our small business program webpage to learn more about new funding announcements and training opportunities for entrepreneurship. The program has also created a public listserv to promote NHGRI small business funding opportunities, general announcements, and resources to help applicants and awardees maximize their commercialization successes. The NIH Cloud Lab is part of the NIH Science and Technology Research Infrastructure for Discovery, Experimentation, and Sustainability. All of that is abbreviated STRIDES which is funded by the NIH's Office of Data Science Strategy and managed by the Center for Information Technology. Now, the NIH Cloud Lab is a 90-day, no-cost program that provides eligible researchers with $500 in credits for cloud services that they can get from Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, or Microsoft Azure. These researchers also get access to curated bioinformatics tutorials and support from, from NIH experts. The NIH Cloud Lab is open to NIH-funded researchers at institutions eligible for NIH funding. And participants can sign up for any time to evaluate if the cloud is suitable for their projects without a long-term commitment. And the program is designed to address common challenges in cloud adoption by offering relevant training, including access to curated bioinformatics and generative AI tutorials, as well as support from NIH experts. And then meanwhile, the NIH Office of Data Science Strategy, or ODSS, leads NIH's strategic plan for data science, which is coordinating across NIH to modernize data resources, foster a diverse workforce, and advance data technologies and methods. And this year, NHGRI signed onto four data science funding opportunities supported by ODSS. The first is a notice of special interest supporting NIH-managed projects that may benefit from using the cloud. The receipt information you will note is provided in the far right column. The second is soliciting competitive revision applications that focus on data reuse and secondary data analysis and NIH-funded data repositories. The third requests applications for building sustainable software tools for open science. And lastly, the fourth provides salary support for exceptional research software engineers. NHGRI is encouraging applications to these four funding opportunities, which are fully funded by ODSS. For more information and eligibility criteria, points of contact, et cetera, et cetera, visit the relevant NIH grants and funding pages. Moving on, the Electronic Medical Records and Genomics, or EMERGE network, is working with 10 clinical sites nationwide to evaluate the impact of genome-informed risk assessments, or GIRAs, which include monogenic risk, polygenic risk scores, family health history, and clinical covariance on participant and clinician behaviors on decision making. Now, Emerge has met its goal of recruiting 25,000 participants across all 10 sites. Almost half of these participants self-reported as being an underrepresented race or ethnicity, allowing the continual expansion of genomics research across more diverse populations. Data collection is complete, with gears generated for over 17,000 participants and returned to the electronic health records for over 16,000 participants. About 24% of these return GIRAs demonstrate a high risk for one of 10 common complex diseases. These high-risk results are returned not only through the electronic health records, but are also actively through a conversation between a provider and a participant. 
Um, the network is beginning to capture outcomes following these high-risk results by assessing patient and provider actions. So stay tuned. The multi-omics for disease um, for health and disease, or MOHD, which is pronounced MODE Consortium, aims to advance the application of multi-omics technologies for studying health and disease in ancestrally diverse populations. The consortium is finishing up their planning year, which focused on developing approaches to community engagement and establishing consensus on the study design. And soon they will begin enrolling 1,800 1,800 participants from diverse populations at six study sites across the United States. Participants will be invited to attend an in-person visit at which phenotypic and exposures data will be measured. Um, biospecimens will also be collected to produce multi-omic profiles that combine genomic, transcriptomic, epigenomic, metabolomic, and proteomic data. And the consortium, of course, aims to integrate this wide variety of data types, including demographic, clinical, social determinants of health, environmental, and the omics profiles. These data will form a basis for a rich, standardized, and harmonized data set that will be widely available to the research community. The Clinical Genome Resource, or ClinGen, evaluates and disseminates the clinical relevance of genes and genomic variants for use in precision medicine and research. And um, in, in May, um, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, or ASCO, published an article to guide use of multi-gene panels for germline genetic testing for patients with cancer. The article detailed their process in selecting evidence to help determine which genes to include in their guidelines for hereditary cancer panels, stating that the evidence assessment of the ClinGen expert panels inform the final selection of genes and the strength of the recommendations for each. And as an example of using ClinGen gene validity classification as evidence for their gene selections, we can go no farther than looking at the APC gene, which ASCO recommends for including in testing for colorectal cancer, gastric cancer, and ad adenocortical tumors. This really nicely illustrates how ClinGen's expert panels specifically those under the ClinGen's hereditary cancer clinical domain working groups can help the broader scientific and clinical communities. And to round out ClinGen's 10th anniversary celebration, an award ceremony was hosted to recognize the achievements and contributions of its members. Nominations were submitted in the following categories, ClinGen Community Star, Trainee Early Career Publication, ClinGen Significant Contributor, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, or JEDI, Expert Panel, Super Submitters, and Publications. All awardees were highlighted on ClinGen social media accounts like the Community Star awardees shown in this LinkedIn post. NHGRI's Joanella Morales was recognized under the JEDI Award for her active participation in the ClinGen Ancestry and Diversity Working Group and her support in developing the ClinGen JEDI Action Plan. The Polygenic Risk Methods in Diverse Population, or PRIME Consortium, is developing methods and refining polygenic risk scores, or PRSs, to improve disease risk predictions in populations with diverse ancestries. Uh, recently, Bu Tuong, at one of the PRIME study sites, published a paper in Cell Genomics that introduces two new methods. These are called PRX Mix and PRX. That's better, yep. For, and these methods are used for enhancing accuracy in predicting clinical phenotypes. These methods provide a framework to benchmark and leverage the combined power of PRSs for optimal performance in diverse populations. Now, this figure is from the paper that demonstrates the increased prediction accuracy of PRS mix and PRX mix plus when compared with the best performing PRSs in the polygenic score catalog an open database of polygenic risk scores. These methods were tested using genomic data from people of Euro European ancestry from the All of Us cohort, now that's what's depicted in panel A on the left, and also South Asian ancestry from the genes and health cohort, and that's what's depicted in panel B. 
The Prime Consortium is currently developing a project to implement and test the performance of these new methods using genomic data inclusive of many other ancestries. In De on December 12th and 13th, later on this year, NHGRI's Genomic Medicine Working Group of this council will convene its 16th Genomic Medicine Meeting, this time jointly with the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. The goal of the meeting is to identify needs, opportunities, and challenges for applying a patient's genomic information in the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of infectious diseases. Persistent barriers and evidence gaps will be examined as opportunities for additional research. Uh, the meeting will be streamed live on NHGRI's YouTube channel, uh, Genome TV. The International Health Cohorts Consortium, or ISCC, is a global community of cohorts working together to advance science and improve health for all. Its mission is to forge connections among research cohorts that revolutionize population health science by providing sustainable data infrastructure, cultivating a collaborative research environment, and promoting policies and best practices that foster connectivity, interoperability, and reciprocity. In August, IHCC held a joint conference with the Precision Health Research Singapore, called PRECISE, called the PRECISE IHCC Conference with the theme from Cohorts to Clinics, the New Landscape for Global Healthcare. The conference aimed to bring together diverse perspectives on global health challenges, identify issues related to integrating cohort studies in biobanks for translational research, and champion early career scientists in genomic and precision medicine. Important topics discussed at this conference, which involved 703 attendees from five continents, included biobanks for precision medicine, data validation and discovery, data sharing, ethics and policy, and genetic counseling and community engagement. Moving on, the Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications, or LC Research Program, supports research that anticipates, explores, and addresses the implications of genetics and genomics on individuals, families, and communities. The sixth LC Congress, or LCCon 2024, which had the theme Reimagining the Benefits of Genomic Science, was held uh, this past June. The conference was widely attended and included both in person and virtual components. The conference materials, including recordings of the presentations, are now available on the LC Hub resource. Additionally, NHGRI has released a new funding opportunity seeking applicants to host the next series of LC Congress meetings which will take place in 2026, 2028, and 2030. Um, applications for this are due November 18th of this year. In July, NHGRI released a new funding opportunity um, entitled Building Partnerships and Broadening Perspectives to Advance Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications Research, which is abbreviated BBAER, but is pronounced BEAR. The BEAR program will support transdisciplinary LC research conducted by groups that include community experts. Capacity building for LC research and workforce development are required along with strategic management. To apply, organizations must have received less than $30 million per year in total NIH funding for the past three fiscal years and be located in the United States. Applicants may partner with organizations that do not meet these eligibility criteria. The funding opportunity has one receipt date for the next three years, and the first application due date is November 15th. A recently completed pre-application webinar was recorded and is now available on NHGRI's YouTube channel, Genome TV. In May, NIH hosted a two-day workshop on population descriptors in genomic legacy data. Over 250 participants, um, including leaders of genomic data science resources, Researchers who use legacy and other partners joined to summarize current approaches, define challenges for harmonizing, interoperating, analyzing, and dealing with legacy data, and developing practical recommendations that can be widely adopted, and finally, to identify opportunities for additional research. Now, through talks and panels and breakout groups, workshop attendees engaged in conversation and offered ideas for future directions. Uh, these include thoughtful study design and transparent justification of the choice of descriptors. Oh, sorry. Um, expanded engagement with participant communities. Increase researcher education to avoid misuse of labels. Promoting responsible use of descriptors by funders, policymakers, and journalists. 
and the development of guardrails and guidelines that can be widely adopted for encouraging diversity and inclusion among study participants. And I would now like to briefly highlight three recent publications supported by NHGRI's extramural investigator-initiated research grants. The first of these publications by Xi'an and colleagues described Deep GC, a novel approach for conducting gene set enrichment analyses using deep neural networks. Um, this approach was shown to be more sensitive than previous gene set enrichment analysis approaches while maintaining comparable specificity. The second of these is a publication by Pascal and colleagues explored why young adults choose to include or not to include their parents in decisions related to genomic testing. Significant factors related to logistical issues and the closeness of the parent-child relationship. The study recommends that researchers and clinicians provide young adults with the opportunity to involve parents or peers in research and clinic visits. The third publication by Fejo and colleagues explored the mechanism by which the growth differentiation factor 15, or GDF15 gene, causes nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. The researchers determined that most GDF15 protein is derived from the fetus and placenta. They also discovered that people with low GDF15 levels prior to pregnancy were more susceptible to nausea and vomiting during pregnancy compared to people who already had high levels of GDF15. Moving on uh, to, actually, we don't have anything on the Common Fund, but we do have something to say about the NIH All of Us Research Program, which, as you well know, is seeking to build a cohort of over one million or more participants, reflecting the diversity of the United States. The program is partnering with participants to advance precision medicine and change health care to the benefit of all. Back in June, the NIH Office of the Director and the All of Us Research Program published a notice of information describing how the program's data provide opportunities for research, training, and career development for researchers when reporting, responding to NIH parent announcements and notices of funding opportunities. In addition, recently the program started to enroll children from birth through age four at different sites across the country. The work updates protocols based on feedback provided by partners and parents following a pilot effort in 2023. This new recruitment will allow researchers to study risk factors, effective prevention, and therapeutic approaches for diseases of childhood. And in an effort to continue expanding access to all of us data, the program is now accepting applications for access to the researcher workbench from commercial organizations. All of us has implemented numerous safeguards to protect privacy, such as removing direct identifiers and prohibiting the download of participant data. And with that, I'll move on to the areas of communication, policy, and education. I'll remind you that NHGRI's History of Genomics program has an oral history program, and we re recently released a new oral history interview of Sarah Tishkoff who's professor of biology and genetics at the University of Pennsylvania. In this interview, Sarah recounts her early anthropological work in the laboratory of Alan Wilson at UC Berkeley, as well as her decades-long groundbreaking research studying human genomic variation in Africa. This interview marks the 44th such video released as part of our growing oral history collection. The history of genomics program um, also collaborated with the NIH Sexual and Gender Minority Office and the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health to host a virtual symposium this past July entitled Exploring the Many Dimensions of Sex and Gender in the Genomics Era. Now, the symposium brought together experts, including physicians, genomics researchers, and social scientists, to clarify some of the complexities related to sex and gender. Um, and this is particularly in light of the social and genomic advances and histories of these very complex topics. Over 2,000 people registered and nearly 1,000 unique individuals attended the event. And audience members submitted hundreds of questions which informed discussion among the event's 16 panelists and three moderators. Now, this conversation will, hof will, will hopefully aid scientists and policymakers and the public in understanding the many di dimensions of sex and gender, especially in the context of health and genomics. NHGRI has received feedback from a wide variety of stakeholders, from genetic counselors who said these talks are helping them structure conversations related to variations in sex conditions, 
to students who have never seen their questions about sex, gender, and genomics so thoughtfully addressed by a government scientific organization, to college professors who plan to use some of these talks in their classes. And recordings of the symposium are available at NHGRI's YouTube channel, Genome TV, and a variety of written products are being curated to continue the conversations. Um, the History of Genomics program has gone on and done more. They recently created a new archival resource focused on the historical records of a major former institute leader, Jane Peterson. Now, Jane served as associate director of the Extramural Research Program at NHGRI for many years, and during her tenure, she helped oversee many major NHGRI programs, including some of the earliest grants for the genome sequencing centers that would participate in the Human Genome Project. Well, as you might imagine, when she retired in 2014, she had accumulated dozens and dozens of boxes of paper documents, which the NHGRI History of Genomics program digitized, preserved, and cataloged. And they've now organized this in something called the Jane Peterson Collection, which features a keyword searchable tool that will allow researchers to navigate through Jane's voluminous collection of documents. And in the spirit of we keep everything, we really keep everything. So for this director's report, Archival Spotlight, this is fun. The History of Genomics program dug up something from our archive that's just a little different. Okay, you ready for this? Okay, this is a letter that was sent to then, to send to Kentucky Senator Mitch McConnell in February of 1989 regarding recent news coverage about the Human Genome Project, which was going to start later in the year. And that was getting a lot of political traction. Now, the constituent who wrote the senator sent the letter suggesting that instead of sequencing the human genome, researchers might consider creating a genetically modified winter tomato that could match the flavor of a homegrown summer tomato, and instead proposed a so-called tomato flavor project. They wrote that increasing the sales of winter tomatoes could possibly generate enough, re enough revenue to then fund the Human Genome Project. Well, this is the government, right? You got to write back. So McConnell forwarded the letter shown in the middle to Elka Jordan in the Office of Human Genome Research requesting a response. And those of you who knew Elka gave a thoughtful response. Although she was sympathetic to the suggestion in her response, that's shown on the right, Elka ultimately tried to reassure the person that the Human Genome Project was indeed the more worthy endeavor, noting that any technology development for the Human Genome Project would likely help plant researchers develop a better flavored tomato. So alas, tomato genome sequencing would ultimately have to take a back seat to human genome sequencing. So that's the spotlight. And again, a little bit of fun. In order to successfully sequence complete ape genomes, does one really need to become an ape? That's the question. Well, no, but NHGRI postdoc Brandon Pickett tried anyway. And so back in April, researchers in Adam Filippi's intramural research group generated the first complete sex chromosome sequence, uh, or sequences, from non-human primates, an incredibly difficult task given the challenge of sequencing highly repetitive DNA in the sex chromosomes. While with complete sequences of the X and Y chromosomes from five great apes and one lesser ape, scientists can learn more about the evolution and biology of humans and these endangered species. In addition to a press release and other materials and all the serious stuff, the NHGRI Office of Communications uh, had some fun. They worked with Adam Filippi's group to create a fun and educational video to highlight this research with none other than NHGRI postdoc uh, Brandon Pickett who led the study actually playing the ape in the video. And then one last update from uh, the Office of Communications. Oh, no, there's one more after that, two more. Um, they recently, over the summer, we brought in two prominent science communicators to the NIH campus. Um, in July, uh, Kara Deneen, who's the creator, host, and producer of the award-winning genetics podcast DNA Today, gave a talk entitled Mastering the Mic, which provided insights on being both a host and a guest in science interviews. Over the past 12 years, DNA Today has produced over 230 episodes, uh, some of which highlight staff from NHGRI. A genetic counselor by training, Kira uses her show to educate the public on genetic and public health topics through event coverage, news stories, book reviews, and interviews. And then in August, Emily Grassley joined us to share her personal journey transitioning from a studio artist to becoming a science communicator. 
From 2013 to 2020, she worked as the first ever chief curiosity correspondent for the Field Museum in Chicago, creating more than 200 episodes of The Brain Scoop, a national history-themed YouTube channel whose videos have been viewed by literally tens of millions of times by people around the world. And during Emily's visit, she gave a public talk and she met with NHGRI staff and as with Kira, also to discuss potential future collaborations. And then in May, the, uh, the busy Office of Communications invited journalists to attend an expert panel discussion on current and future investments in RNA research. Uh, the convened researchers uh, were experts in the latest DNA research efforts, including methods for sequencing different types of RNA and detecting RNA modifications. The panel discussed the new RNA research funding from NIH and the National Science Foundation, also discussed how emerging technologies are being used to improve RNA sequencing, and importantly, how the recent National Academies report that calls for developing technology and infrastructure that will allow for the complete sequencing of RNA and all of its modifications and how that right report might be used going forward. Uh, this media roundtable had great attendance uh, with reporters from Time Magazine, Science, The New York Times, Axios, USA Today, and others. In July, and actually for the first time in five years, educators participated in an in-person as opposed to virtual um, short course that the Education Community Involvement Branch puts on every year. This event welcomed 28 middle school, high school, community college, and tribal college science educators to the NIH campus. The annual course featured lectures from NIH leader, NHGRI leadership, intramural researchers, and other NIH staff. Guests from the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories DNA Learning Center, the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, and the National Center for Biotechnology Information led hands-on sequencing and computational teaching activities. I personally interacted and engaged with the educators by delivering the keynote presentation and hosting two focus group discussion sessions. The return to meeting in person allowed educators to engage, collaborate, and communicate with staff and educators from around the nation. And to date, the short course has taught over 225 educators. Um, this month, the Inter Society Coordinating Center for Practitioner Education and Genomics, or ISCC PEG, welcomed a new co chair, Rebecca Kronk. ISCC PEG convenes healthcare professionals and educators to improve genomic literacy through the creation and sharing of resources and best practices. Rebecca is the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Professor at Duquesne University School of Nursing. She's a board-certified pediatric nurse practitioner with a strong commitment to improving genomic literacy. She's been a member of ISCC PEG since 2020 and is actively involved in that organization's Nursing Genomics Project Group. I would like to say on behalf of NHGRI that we thank Rich Haspiel, who's the outgoing ISCC PEG co-chair for his many years of dedicated service in that role. And lastly, just a few things to say about the intramural program. Um, in July, Marcus Hodges came to NHGRI as the new director of the Institute's Intramural Training Office, or ITO. ITO is the focal point and coordinating group for training within NHGRI's intramural research program. In addition to offering resources and information, the office provides support and assistance to the Institute's diverse group of intramural trainees, starting at recruitment and extending to assistance to helping them launch their careers. Marcus has led training and mentorship programs since 2011. After receiving his PhD from Howard University, he was the fellowship director for the National Biosafety and Biocontainment Training Program and served on its scientific advisory board. He comes to NHGRI most recently from NIH's National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, where he served as lead for the intramural trainee development in the Office of Policy, Communications, and Education. Oh, did I? Sorry about that. Thank you. I thought I did. That's Marcus. Okay. I'll let pause for a minute, make sure everybody knows what he looks like. Okay. In July, the New York Times highlighted a potential cure for progeria, a rare disease that accelerates aging in humans. That, is, that seems to be on the horizon due to groundbreaking gene editing research. None other than Francis Collins. I think you've heard of him. He's the former NHGRI director, the former NIH director, but he's currently an NHGRI senior investigator. He's been heavily involved in work on this um, uh, since he was a medical trainee at Yale University starting in 1982 when he encountered his first progeria patient. His interest then reignited years later when he met a family affected by the disorder 
uh, leading him to prioritize progeria research within his lab despite the rarity of the disorder. While Francis's work on progeria took a significant leap forward with the advent of CRISPR and most recently base editing, which of course is an advanced gene editing technique developed by David Liu's research group. And Francis and his team at NHGRI are now working towards a clinical trial, which is anticipated to start within two years. The success of this project would demonstrate the potential of gene editing as a transformative tool in genomic medicine, potentially revolutionizing the treatment of rare genetic disorders. The NHGRI intramural research program has once again been very productive since the last council meeting. I'll just give you a few highlights, as I always do. First, there was a study uh, from Ben Solomon's group that looked at the accuracy of language-based AI tools, such as ChatGPT, for actually diagnosing genetic diseases. And it turns out that while AI tools make very accurate diagnoses from textbook-like explanations of genetic disorders, they were less accurate when analyzing descriptions that were actually written out by the patients themselves. These findings help us understand the limitations of AI in clinical settings and the need for more diverse training data to improve these tools. In a very different study, Sean Burgess' group used longer DNA sequencing to assemble a genome sequence of the paradise fish. And they then went on to identify and annotate over 20,000 protein coding genes in the sequence genome. And by embracing less conventional experimental organisms, researchers can gain broader insights into evolution and development um, through genomics. And finally, in yet another study uh, that Francis Collins has going on in his lab, he profiled the transcriptome of human pancreatic islet cells in hyperglycemic conditions and found thousands of genes associated with time in culture, glucose exposure, or both. And the study provides insights into gene pathways that may help researchers understand how pre-diabetics transition into becoming diabetic patients. And that's the end of my director's report. Before I formally end, I want to again remind you that we have a regularly updated, user-friendly, one-stop shop for staying connected with me and NHGRI. If you come and visit this site at the website shown there, and then you scroll down, you will get a menu of options of a major resources associated with this institute. It includes direct links to genome.gov website, my biography, my monthly newsletter, The Genomics Landscape, and my three social media feeds, X, LinkedIn, and most recently, Instagram. But also on this page are convenient links to the 2020 NHGRI strategic vision, our Building a Diverse Genomics Workforce Action Agenda, the NHGRI brochure, um, the NHGRI's uh, YouTube channel, Genome TV, the oral histories I mentioned earlier, and our talking glossary of genomic and genetic terms. And if that doesn't uh, fulfill what you're looking for, you can scroll further down. You'll find some of my more recent talks, uh, podcasts, and various other publications. So I hope you use this uh, when you're looking to find a one-stop one place to get connected with me and NHGRI. Well, personal thanks to the many NHGRI staff members who contributed to the slides and associate information I just went through. Always it requires a group to put an, a presentation like this together. I would especially uh, like to thank the folks in, uh, who helped the director's report at various stages, and especially the Office of Communications for creating the electronic resource associated uh, with the director's report. And a special thanks to the usual uh, ringleaders uh, involved in this. Um, and you can uh, you could see uh, Chris um, and 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 uh, Vanessa uh, shown here. And those with good visual acuity will notice the puffer fish with sunglasses that they photoshopped in, thinking I wouldn't notice it to the right, um, but it's there. So with that, um, I will stop, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Any questions for Eric? All right. Okay. Turn if, it over to you. Yeah.